Hi everyone, we're just going to wait a few seconds for people to filter in before we get started. Hi hey everyone, we're just going to wait a few seconds for people to filter in before we start. All right, well, let's get started. Thanks, Emily, and good afternoon and welcome, everyone. I'm Bill Maurer, the Dean of the School of Social Sciences here at UC Irvine, and I'm delighted to welcome you all virtually to this, uh, the kind of kickoff event for our sixth annual Lunar New Year celebration. Now, obviously, things are a little different this year, um, and we are operating in this virtual Zoom space, but nevertheless, we've assembled a full program beginning with this academic talk uh, with our distinguished visitor um, to be followed by some uh, celebrations and performances, a cooking demonstration and other activities, all virtually online, um, which we hope that you can join us to enjoy. If you have not registered for the next set of events, you can just go to socci.uci.edu, that's S-O-C-S-C-I.uci.edu, where you'll see uh, the homepage for Lunar New Year and a, a link to register so that you can enjoy um, all of the festivities. And it looks like um, uh, Brian Spivey has now put that into the chat for everyone to see as well. I'm delighted to uh, introduce Professor Emily Baum. Emily is Associate Professor of History here at UC Irvine, where she does research on contemporary China um, and the history and cultural understandings of deviance, illness, uh, health, and mental health. Um, she is the director of the Long U.S. China Institute, which coordinates research and programming related to contemporary China for the entire Irvine campus. Professor Baum, I will hand it off to you and thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dean Maurer, for that wonderful introduction and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Happy Lunar New Year and welcome to Herbs and Roots, A History of Chinese Medicine in the United States. As Dean Maurer said, my name is Emily Baum. I'm the director of the Long U.S. China Institute at UC Irvine. And it is my honor to be able to kick off UCI's annual Lunar New Year celebration with this talk. So as many of you probably know, complementary and alternative medicine is a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States today. And Chinese medicine makes up a significant portion of those sales. What you might not know is that Chinese medicine actually has a fairly long history in the United States, dating back to at least the middle of the 19th century. Today, we're going to hear just a little bit about that history. And we are lucky to be joined by two scholars who have done extensive research on Chinese medicine around the world. So presenting first will be a scholar who literally wrote the book on Chinese medicine in the United States, Tamara Bennett Shelton. Professor Bennett Shelton is an associate professor of history at Claremont McKenna College, where she researches and teaches on topics ranging from the American West to Asian American history to the history of medicine. Her most recent book, which was just published by Yale University Press in 2019, is called Herbs and Roots, A History of Chinese Doctors in the American Medical Marketplace. And that book recently won the 2020 Phi Alpha Theta Award for Best Book. Professor Bennett Shelton is going to speak for about 20 minutes. And then following her remarks, we're going to hear some discussant comments from my colleague, Mei Zhan. Uh, professor Zhan is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology here at UCI, and she is widely known as an expert on the transnational circulations of Chinese medicine. She is the author of Otherworldly, Making Chinese Medicine Through Transnational Frames, which was published by Duke University Press. And she's currently working on a new project on the reimaginings and reinventions of Chinese medicine in China today. So altogether, the discussion will take about 30 minutes and we will leave the remaining time for Q&A. If you would like to ask a question at any point, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll collect those questions and ask them on your behalf. Uh, and so for now, without any further ado, I will turn it over to Tamara. 
Well, thank you so much, Emily. Um, thank you everyone for, for coming out uh, virtually for this uh, exciting celebration. Happy Lunar New Year. I'm really delighted to be uh, sort of back at UCI uh, today. Uh, as I was thinking about giving this talk, I was remembering that I think a little over a year ago, I actually gave uh, the first book talk uh, at UCI with the Long Institute. Uh, that was in the book war times when we actually did things in person. Um, so it was really nice uh, to have been welcomed to campus then and it's nice to be here uh, like this today. As Emily said, I'm going to give a, a very brief talk. I think I have about 20 minutes. So I'm just going to try in those 20 minutes to give you a kind of synopsis of what you would find in the book. And I will be delighted after uh, Professor John's uh, comments to take any questions that you might have. I am going to share my screen really quickly here so that I can um, show you some images from the book as I speak. There we go. All right. So. Um, so the title of my book is Herbs and Roots, A History of Chinese Doctors in the American Medical Marketplace. Now, for many Americans, when we think of Chinese medicine and its history in this country, we tend to think of this, acupuncture and the nationwide frenzy for it in the 1970s. But of course, acupuncture was and is just one of many traditional Chinese therapies and its discovery, or I would argue it's rediscovery in the 1970s is in fact the end point of my book and not its beginning. Chinese medicine has a very long history in the United States. It dates back to the colonial period and extends up to the present. Long before mass migration from China to the United States, Chinese materia medica crossed the ocean in both directions. In the 1850s, as the first waves of Chinese immigrants began coming to America, doctors were among them. Now, there were a wide range of healing practices in China, but up until the 1970s, immigrant doctors tended to come from this sort of middling class of merchant physicians uh, who learned diagnosis by pulse or pulsology. So if you've ever been to um, see an herbalist or an acupuncturist and they take your um, pulse with three fingers, that's they were their um, sort of trying to feel for imbalances in, in the body by doing that, that's pulsology. Um, so, so Chinese immigrant doctors would have learned pulsology and also herbalism in family businesses. Back home in China, they would have specialized in a single proprietary remedy, but abroad they became general practitioners. They diagnosed and treated all manner of ailments. They set bones uh, and sometimes they delivered babies or provided abortions. Chinese doctors in America served both Chinese and non-Chinese patients. They advertised their services in English and Spanish language newspapers. And over time, Chinese medicine, along with other medical knowledge systems deemed irregular or alternative, both facilitated and undermined the consolidation of Western style medical science. So my book, Herbs and Roots, chronicles roughly 200 years of the history of Chinese medicine in the United States. It's a history of transplantations and transformations, but it's also a history of American medicine, its professionalization and regularization. And it is a history of Chinese immigrant life. I began researching and writing this book while I was teaching in Oregon. And just about everyone uh, in Oregon becomes familiar with this fellow, Dr. Ng He. From 1888 to 1948, Ng He sold traditional Chinese remedies at a quite remarkable apothecary called Kamwa Chung, located way out east um, in the town of John Day, about a five hour drive from Portland. When Ng He was too elderly, when he was too infirm to continue to run his business, his nephew, who was also an herbalist, moved him to a nursing home in Portland and um, closed the door. He literally put the key in the lock and closed it and left everything inside, sitting in place, gathering dust for nearly 30 years. In the 1970s, when the state assumed control over the property, they discovered a veritable treasure trove 
of historical artifacts like Tutankhamun's tomb, right? Oh, tins and jars and boxes of remedies, company records, personal letters, personal effects, and so forth, all just sitting there. Today, Kamwachung is a state heritage site. Um, it is, uh, I think, the largest archive of Chinese medicine in the United States. It's a museum. You can go and you can visit it. And Inghe has been the subject of an award-winning documentary that aired on Oregon Public Broadcasting. So I became aware of Inghe while living in Oregon. And as any good social historian would, I, I began to wonder about others like him. How many doc Chinese doctors were there practicing in the United States? Um, where were they? What did they do? More broadly, I really wanted to understand what their lived experiences could tell us about their time and place. And I thought maybe, you know, maybe I'll find enough for an article. But it turns out that Chinese doctors were everywhere. Everywhere there were Chinese people, there were Chinese doctors. They were in every state of the Union, as well as Canada and Mexico. But unsurprisingly, they were more numerous in places where Chinese immigrants tend to concentrate. So we're talking about California and the West. They were a small but significant cohort. Chinese doctors were part of the mass immigration from China that began in the 1850s. Um, you know, they came with other immigrants from their country. After 1850 in any given year, there were probably no more than about 200 full-time practitioners of Chinese medicine working in the United States. But they assumed an outsized importance within their communities. They were, of course, healthcare providers. They were educators. They trained their children and um, members of their extended family in traditional practices. They provided essential services, especially when mainstream medical care was not an option for Chinese people. But not all the work they did was strictly medical. Chinese apothecaries were recreational and religious centers. They were post offices. A Chinese herbalist might serve as his or her community's banker, translator, labor broker, or grocer. They sponsored new arrivals. They extended charity when possible. After Chinese exclusion barred the entry of working class Chinese, some Chinese doctors participated in forgery and smuggling networks that allowed their countrymen to circumvent immigration restrictions. My sources for um, this project were fairly eclectic. Um, you know, so archival research is really sort of the bread and butter of what historians do, the work that we do. But there really are very few archives, formal archives or museums that collect the records of Chinese herbalists practicing in the United States. So I very quickly uh, kind of ran out of places to look and I had to turn to archaeological records um, to newspaper and travel accounts and court cases. But a lot of what I have to work with are print advertisements, print advertisements in Chinese, in English, and to a lesser extent in Spanish. Now, the earliest example I have found of a Chinese doctor advertising his services in the United States is this. Um, in April of 1799, an advertisement ran in a Harrisburg, Pennsylvania newspaper. A man identifying himself as Chinese doctor, Dr. John Howard, announced that he was seeing patients at his home on 2nd Street. Howard claimed that he had come from Canton and he promised to treat a range of ailments with herbs and roots that he had imported from China. His advertisements ran in a Harrisburg newspaper throughout the spring and early summer of 1799 and then he moved to a nearby town, he moved to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and advertised in its paper through the fall of 1800. I believe that John Howard was the first practitioner of Chinese medicine in the United States to advertise his services in English. But who was he? Was he even in fact Chinese? Um, now Chinese men and women did travel abroad and often at great distances prior to 1800. They went to Europe, they went to India, uh, they went to other parts of Asia, as well as to Mexico and Hawaii. But relatively few Chinese migrants went to the United States or went to the British colonies that would become the United States. Their presence there went unrecorded until the 1810s when a 
very few religious students and domestic servants began to appear in the written record. So John Howard, if he was would have preceded those men's arrival by more than a decade. John Howard could have been an American pseudonym that he adopted because it was more easily pronounced and remembered by his English speaking clientele. I have plenty of examples from later years when Chinese doctors do exactly that. But to be honest, I know very little about him. John Howard might not have been Chinese at all. He could have just simply been someone who spent significant time in China, either as a foreign merchant or as a missionary. He does not appear in um, either the 1800 census for Harrisburg or for that of Carlisle, nor does he appear really in any other public records aside from a few references here and there in newspapers and one medical journal. So where he does appear, I, I found this to be a little interesting, where he does appear, he appears um, in a Connecticut newspaper that announced the opening of his business in 1800. And this um, newspaper announcement mostly just listed the many diseases and afflictions that he cured and it praised his abilities. It called him a descendant of Galen and Hippocrates. The announcement said nothing about his nativity. If he was Chinese, this Connecticut newspaper did not think it was important enough to mention. Okay, so what do we make of that? The idea that someone in South Central Pennsylvania would be practicing Chinese medicine was perhaps not very surprising because by 1800, 50 years before mass immigration from China to the United States began, Americans were to varying degrees already familiar with Chinese medicine. Americans in the colonial period and early Republic descended from a European world with a long-standing curiosity for all things Chinese, including traditional Chinese medicine. In early America, among the educated elite, there was great appetite for information about China, its philosophy, its history, and also medical practices, um, especially herbalism, but also acupuncture. In the second half of the 19th century, Chinese herbalists borrowed advertising strategies um, from makers of patent or proprietary remedies. Um, so these included conventional display advertisements in newspapers, longer form advertising booklets, um, like this is the cover of one of those booklets, and trade cards like these. So I want to show you some of my most favorite sources from this project. These are trade cards from Inghe's apothecary, Kamwa Chung. And what you might notice about them is they are directly appealing to women. Chinese doctors targeted non-Chinese women, both English and Spanish speaking in their advertisements, just like this. Throughout the 19th century, American women were both major consumers of and practitioners of irregular medicine. The American popular press often portrayed women as overly susceptible to what they called oriental quackery, but it really failed to recognize the ways in which Western style medical science failed to meet the needs of female patients. Chinese medicine um, likely appealed to women on many levels. Uh, maybe it was the distance and discretion offered by Chinatown offices that might have been important to some of them. But perhaps more importantly, the prevalence of herbal remedies and non-invasive procedures in Chinese medicine might have been attractive to women otherwise facing the prospect of um, painful uh, and possibly uh, dangerous gynecological surgeries. So these trade cards from the 1910s advertising Kamwa Chung aimed to sell not only, as it says there, medical herbs, groceries, Chinese goods, and general merchandise, but also a kind of vision of modern, affluent femininity. So you can see, these are just three that I have. I have about, um, about eight that I, have, that I found. Um, each card uh, portrays a white woman. We get Clara here on um, the right of your screen posing in this fur trimmed coat, got Mildred um, on the left, playfully tipping a hat and Margaret looking very regal in her finely draped robes and upswept hair. These were not, I'm gonna go out 
on a limb here and say, these were not images of the Eastern Oregon ranching and farm wives who actually patronized Kam Wa Chung, but they were perhaps representations of what those women aspired to be. Now, apart from print advertising, my other major source for this project were oral histories with the American born children of Chinese herbalists. Um, for example, um, these are the parents of one of my, um, one of my sources, uh, Anna Dawn of Tucson, Arizona. Her parents, Chan Du Sung, who's on the left of your screen, and Aster Lee on the right of your screen, opened and operated a series of Chinese apothecaries across the American West in the early 20th century. And Anna, um, their daughter, very generously donated her family's business records to um, the Claremont College's library, which is where, where I am. Um, and so they are publicly available. They're available to researchers um, forever. Now, as I began to locate Chinese doctors in the historical record, I became interested in the way that their stories intersected with the history of American medicine more broadly. And while the book um, begins in the late 18th century and extends up to basically the near present, let's say, my primary concern lies with the late 19th and early 20th centuries, what Americanists like me um, often call the long progressive era. The long progressive era, the late 19th and early 20th centuries were a critical time for the history of the Chinese in America and the history of medicine in America. You may well know in 1882, Congress passed the first Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited working class Chinese from entering the country and caused over uh, the subsequent decades a decline in the Chinese population in the United States. A shrinking stock of co-ethnic customers may have compelled some Chinese herbalists to cast a wider net for non-Chinese patients. And I do see an increase in the English and Spanish language advertisements after 1882. Around the same time, the, a new science of disease transmission based on the germ theory was becoming popular with formally trained European and American physicians. Beginning in the 1890s, the American Medical Association, the AMA, uh, partnered with state and local governments to standardize medical education and licensing around the germ theory of disease. The AMA aimed to monopolize the medical marketplace and drive unlicensed doctors, including Chinese doctors, out of business. Uh, new licensing exams, concentrating on medical science and pharmacology approved by AMA physicians, and new laws um, imposed fines and jail sentences on doctors practicing without a license. So this is the moment that Chinese doctors chose to become increasingly active in the American medical marketplace. Now you might be thinking that for Chinese doctors, the progressive era did not seem like the best time for that, the, did not seem like the best time to be getting involved in the American healthcare business. And indeed, anti-Chinese racism prevented nearly all of them from sitting for licensing exams or otherwise securing a legal right to practice. So they practiced without a license and faced prosecutions, paid fines, and spent time in jail for doing so. Now, it can be really difficult to square the American consumption of Chinese remedies with prevalent anti-Chinese racism. Throughout the 19th century, Americans embraced Orientalist perceptions of Asians as backwards, barbarous, and effeminate. And these perceptions often justified exclusion, exclusionary and discriminatory policies targeting Asian nations and immigrants. Such racist thinking extended to the realm of Chinese medicine. If Chinese people were primitive, so was Chinese medical knowledge. Attacks on Chinese doctors in English language media frequently ridiculed their therapies as backwards or unscientific. And public health officials unfairly identified American Chinatowns as sites of contagion and Chinese bodies as disease vectors. Yet scientific medicine's monopoly on the medical marketplace was far from complete. 
what I see is that Chinese herb businesses flourished in spaces where regular doctors had not yet consolidated their control. I argue that for American patients skeptical of modern biomedical science, criticism of Chinese medicine could also constitute its allure. In the book, I detail how Chinese doctors advertising effectively self-orientalized. Uh, it played on their non-Chinese patients' racialized expectations of Asian cultures in multiple, sometimes contradictory ways. They overcame anti-Chinese racism. Chinese herbalists overcame anti-Chinese racism by embracing and perpetuating anti-Chinese racism. Now, my book ends with a history that is still very much unfolding the quite valiant, actually, efforts among Chinese and Chinese American scientists from the 1970s to today to effectively deorientalize Chinese medicine by explaining its efficacy through Western style scientific methods and models. Biomedical scientists have been predictably slow to embrace Chinese therapies, which remain largely inaccessible to the average patient. But, and this is the final thing I'd say, but the deliberate speed of Western style science is not solely to blame. After generations of successful self-orientalizing, practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine have very few incentives to deorientalize. In the American medical marketplace, Chinese medicine has thrived as an alternative and not a complement to regular medicine. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, I think I'm going to turn, stop sharing and turn it over to Professor Zhang. All right. Well, thank you, Tamara, for a most uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I just want to say that I really, um, ah. <laughs> okay, well, anyway. <laughs> so, there, uh, 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 really uh, uh, enjoyed uh, reading this wonderful book. Uh, I've seen an earlier uh, version of it uh, a number of years ago, and it's just so wonderful to see it uh, uh, come to uh, fruition. And it's, it's really, uh, it's a very enjoyable read uh, and really gives you a very different sense uh, of what uh, traditional Chinese medicine looks like or looked like uh, outside of um, the sort of more institutionalized uh, version of Chinese medicine or TCM as we know it uh, today. So uh, uh, as I like to, I'm gonna keep the comments uh, brief because I'm sure there are a lot of questions uh, from, a, from, from a very large audience uh, today. So um, I always tell uh, my students, uh, some of them are here, I can see, um, that you know, I find things a lot less interesting once they become acronyms. Um, so Tamara really gives us uh, a sense of traditional Chinese medicine before uh, it became an acronym, right? It is so diverse, so varied, so complex, and it's so deeply rooted. Uh, in not just the everyday life of Chinese immigrants, but uh, just everyday life in the United States. Um, there are so many things, wonderful things about this book. Uh, I'm not gonna have the time to uh, go over them all, but I wanna say that um, what's really neat about this book is that, and about this talk, is that Tamara doesn't pitch Chinese medicine against Western medicine. She doesn't pitch Chinese medicine against biomedicine. Um, I see sort of a very similar approach actually in Shang Lei's, um, another historian, uh, a book called uh, Neither, uh, what is it? <clears throat> Neither Donkey Nor Horse, right? Um, so the argument is that uh, if you look at how, you know, people lived, uh, how these uh, practitioners, doctors, patients lived, um, their struggles were really with the medical establish establishment and with the institution, regardless of whether it was uh, biomedical or traditional Chinese. And I think that's a really important point uh, that Tamara is uh, making uh, in her very detailed uh, 
amazing research, first, first of all, and detailed uh, and vivid account uh, of the lives of these uh, 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 Chinese uh, uh, practitioners and doctors. Um, and something that I think Tamara um, uh, said in the paper version, in the print version of this talk, um, this is not just a history of Chinese medicine, of traditional Chinese medicine. This is also a history of American medicine, right? And that is incredibly, incredibly uh, important. Um, so, you know, uh, sort of going back, I think the discussion of uh, AMA, for example, that was also the moment when, uh, according to uh, the sociologist Paul Starr, who wrote a very famous book called The Social Transformation of American uh, Medicine, which won, you know, all sorts of big prizes. Um, that's the moment when uh, medicine in the United States also emerged as a Right, as a, as a hegemonic institution. Um, so, um, of course, um, uh, you know, the exclusion, like exclusion of all sorts of so called quackery, of uh, women, right, midwifery, for example, uh, of, of course, um, uh, immigrant, uh, immigrants and their uh, medical uh, practices, right, so on and so forth. And I wonder. Um, how our understanding of American uh, history of American medicine uh, would actually change uh, if we, like Tamara, we treat right this part of the history also as part of uh, Amer the history of American medicine rather than kind of setting it aside, right, just as the Chinese immigrant uh, uh, experience. Um, and something else that I really, really love, um, I love these histories and historiographies is that they really show you um, how people lived. And what's really wonderful here uh, is that you see these uh, uh, Chinese uh, doctors also working as bankers, as traders uh, in the post office, so on and so forth. Again, very different, right, from the idea of this kind of institutionalized uh, medicine that we are uh, used to uh, today. And I have a kind of an idiosyncratic, uh, selfish interest uh, in this uh, aspect as well, because I'm writing uh, a book right now. It's called Bring Medicine Back to Life. Um, well, that's the working title, uh, but it probably won't change. Uh, so, and it's about uh, these uh, small startup firms in uh, uh, metropolitan uh, China. Uh, and about these uh, entrepreneurs, right? Kind of like the uh, practitioners that, that Tamara is talking about here, um, how they try to set up their own small shops uh, as a way out of the big TCM, right? Uh, the sort of the scientized, uh, standardized and institutionalized version of Chinese medicine. And as a way of uh, actually out of, you know, uh, sort of corporate, uh, uh, monopoly uh, of uh, uh, Chinese economy uh, today. So um, the slogan, bring medicine back to life. It's sort of, you know, trying to take health uh, back into your own hands and also rethink medicine, not just as something that the doctors do, uh, not just something that happens at, in hospitals and clinics, but, you know, something that you find in cooking, right? In your diet, in meditation, uh, in your you know philosophy of everyday life, so on and so forth. So, um, yes, I love this book and I love reading uh, history uh, because it's not just about what happened before. Tamara's uh, book ends in the 1970s. It's also about what we're doing today, how we can reimagine uh, the present uh, and the future of medicine health and uh, life more uh, broadly. So that's it. Well, thank you so much, um, Tamara, for a wonderful talk and May for providing um, that really wonderful uh, historiographical and, and global context. So um, we're starting to get a bunch of questions. Please feel free to continue to type your questions into the Q&A box. And so I'll just try to go through them. Um, so one question that we've received, and I'm sure Tamara, that this is a question that you get all the time, has to do with the effectiveness of Chinese medicine? I mean, was Chinese medicine actually effective during this time? Was it more effective than, than Western treatments? Why were people compelled to use Chinese medicine rather than Western treatments? Could you just speak a little bit to the effectiveness of it? 
Yeah, that is such a good question. And I do get it all the time. Um, uh, usually it's phrased as like, tell me if it works and what I should be taking, which I cannot answer for you, but I can speak to this question of efficacy. So this is, if I'm gonna take a big step back into the kind of realm of the methodological. So I don't know how many history students are in the audience right now, but maybe you will, um, you will relate. So it is really hard to actually measure historical efficacy. It's really hard to say, did it work or not? One, we don't really have like the records to show, um, you know, patient A took this kind of, um, you know, followed this sort of drug regimen that we might classify as Western style or scientific medicine, and then patient A switched and took a Chinese, you know, doses of Chinese herbs. We really don't have that kind of data at all. And even if we did, it's really hard to say for a given person, um, you know, short of dying, uh, you know, did they feel better? What does it mean to feel good? That's a sort of historically contingent status. What I feel in 2021 makes me feel good might not be what someone in 1881 felt constituted feeling good. So there's a sort of like whole methodological problem of answering this question. But here's what I'll say. Um, we do see, um, uh, let's say, non-Chinese patients, so American patients, the end of the 19th and early 20th century, having a very kind of ecumenical approach to medicine. They were, I, I, I like to say, they really sample very freely from the global buffet of um, health options. They have no qualms about seeing their Chinese doctor for this and then going and consulting with a formally educated Western style scientific, um, you know, purveyor of scientific medicine for something else. Um, they, they were not um, as, let's say, rigidly wed to these categories as we are now. So did they find Chinese medicine to be effective? Sure. Um, did they also find it sometimes not to be effective? Also, yes. So I have letters that were written to Ing He from satisfied customers. I also have letters written to him that say, that thing you gave me, it didn't do a darn thing. I want my money back. It's, it's really very mixed and, and hard to say. Did that actually answer the question? I'm so accustomed to the question of did it work and what should I take that I'm not sure I was prepared for actually a variation on that question. Did I get all the parts? I think you answered that perfectly well okay. and um, exactly what you said about this ecumenical approach to health that people tried what they thought would work. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but they did what they could. Um, so this is an, a question that kind of piggybacked on something that you did touch on in your talk on the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm -hmm. um, and this uh, attendee wanted to know what impact the Chinese Exclusion Act had on the immigration of Chinese medicine practitioners. Were they able to immigrate? Um, if they were able to immigrate, did they have to do so under some sort of exempted category? So how did American policies uh, about immigration affect the development of Chinese medicine during the period that you're studying? It did affect them. They could not immigrate as doctors. They had to immigrate as merchants. And that is one of the reasons why you see um, practitioners of Chinese herbalism in, uh, identifying as uh, purveyors of herbal medicine, that they they will very often say in their advertising, um, diagnosis for free, and uh, and then you know you buy the herbs. So th that's how they got around that. Um, it actually became very helpful for them a little later on in the era of um, increased regulation uh, because they could say simply, I don't practice medicine. Uh, you know, someone comes in my herb shop and just asks me for advice. I give my advice freely. I'm, I'm only selling herbs. That became a very frequent um, uh, kind of defense against charges of practicing without a license. But it starts in, in the era of exclusion and it starts as a way of, of being part of an exempted category, which was the merchant um, category. And kind of continuing this line of thinking about selling herbs, we received another question about where they got these herbs from. Um, Chinese doctors in China today tend to harvest herbs that are kind of local to the region. Was that the same type of practice that um, Chinese doctors in the United States were doing? Did they import them wholesale from China? Can you talk a little bit about where they derived these herbs from? 
Yeah, so this was actually one of the things that I um, was surprised to find in research. So when I started this project, uh, I think I, I mentioned I was living in Oregon. Oregon has a very uh, important and famous school of oriental medicine. It's called the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine. And so when I started the project, I um, was working with people there. Um, they have a translation team. They were translating um, Ing Hay's documents at Kamachang. And I learned a lot about Chinese medicine initially from them. And so what they told me um, was that uh, Chinese doctors in the United States only imported medicines from China. And this had to do with the specificity with which um, medicinal plants and, and animals had to be not only um, foraged or cultivated, but also procured, right? You have to go on a certain day of the month under a certain moon, right? In a certain season um, and, you know, to a certain side of the mountain, right? That there's all this kind of specificity. Um, so that's kind of was sort of my working theory for a very long time until I started finding all of this evidence that in fact, Chinese practitioners of Chinese medicine in the United States were very open to improvising. Um, they, they were open to cultivating their own plants and, and hunting for their own um, animals, uh, reptiles, amphibians, animals, whatever, um, very often because they couldn't import what they needed. So they would do some local substitution, but also kind of because, well, they were here and there was some other stuff that, that looked interesting and they wanted to experiment with it. So, so that was, um, that was a big kind of um, surprise for me. I had a sort of preconceived notion of how that worked. That being said, they did import um, the majority of what they sold through wholesalers um, coming out of China and going to San Francisco and then um, through San Francisco, there'd be this networks of distribution. And, and that became really problematic um, in the 1930s and 40s and 50s because of the, the wars in, in East Asia, um, basically making it impossible for Chinese herbalists to um, import what they needed. And so they had some ways of substituting and finding other sources, but a lot of them went out of business in that, in that time. A lot of them simply couldn't, couldn't survive um, because they couldn't, they couldn't get, they couldn't supply, they couldn't stock their shelves, right? So we have a couple of questions that are interested in the relationship between Chinese medicine and Western medicine or Western scientists. Um, one of these questions comes from Zhuoya Wang, who's actually a professor at, I believe, Cal Poly Pomona. Um, but he is, is curious about whether there were Western trained Chinese American scientists who were interested in traditional Chinese medicine and working with these practitioners in this period. Um, and I'll ask you that question first before I return to a sort of related question. Okay, so this is, I actually have a very long winded response to this because this is a, it's a kind of complicated thing. So, so it depends on what period we're talking about. Um, and I do, in, in one chapter of the book, I look at um, both Chinese immigrant and Chinese American um, students of Western style medical science. So, so, so there are kind of increasing numbers of those individuals over the course of the 20th century. There are very few at the end of the 19th century, and then it, it grows over time, over the course of the 20th century. And so I have a lot to say in the book about kind of the relationship of those practitioners with traditional Chinese medicine. Um, it, it often is very ambivalent because um, MDs are trying to kind of establish their credibility separate from that of uh, traditional Chinese medicine. They don't wanna be sort of painted as um, non-scientific or painted as being um, traditionalist. So there's, there's a kind of storyline like that, but there's another one that really has to do with um, in the earlier period, really the um, impossibility of escaping from these Orientalist expectations. So there are um, uh, Chinese and Chinese Americans who are educated in American medical colleges. Um, for example, his fellow Wa Jin Lam, who um, went to USC um, in, I, I think he graduated from medical school at the end of the 19th century. So he's really one of the very first um, uh, Chinese people to get an MD in the United States. And he tried, he really tried to practice Western style medicine. No one wanted it from him. So he ended up, uh, he ended up moving, he ended up moving um, to Montana 
and having this tremendous career as a Chinese herbalist, um, even though he had an MD. And, the, and his family actually, the last talk I gave, or maybe like two time, two talks ago, I gave a talk at the, um, the um, for the Southern California Chinese Historical Society. And his uh, daughter-in-law was in the audience. And she's like, I didn't, I'm so surprised. She had no idea that I wrote about her father-in-law in the book. And so she emailed me after the talk and, and said, oh my gosh, you know, would you like all this stuff of his that I have? I'm like, no, it's too late, but you know, some other researcher will really want it. Was that the end of that question? Sorry, I think that was that was a bad question. <laughs> you shouldn't still take her up on the offer of collecting uh, <laughs> those archives because I'm sure someone will want them. I know, I know, I should. I mean, gosh, people are so nice. I mean, the the they they come out of the woodwork. I don't know if so. I am half Chinese, and I you know I don't know if this is true of other Chinese Americans, but I feel like we all are somehow related to a Chinese herbalist. So when I started working on this project, it was like you know Uncle Edmund's father in Visalia was an herbalist. You know, like everyone is connected to a Chinese herbalist. There are Tupperwares and cardboard boxes full of this stuff in people's garages and basements and spare rooms. I'm sure. So. Um... The, the second kind of question related to the relationship between Chinese medicine and Western medicine takes the, the opposite angle. And, and this person is curious about whether Chinese doctors were engaging with things like germ theory in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. To what extent did Chinese medicine physicians know about or incorporate these new scientific approaches that were becoming more legitimized during this period? Yes, um, so good question. And there is um, good work that's done on physicians in China um, by Martin Hansen, for example. Um, physicians in China were aware of the germ theory. Um, they, they, they sort of cast it a little bit differently, um, but I mean, really as far back, I think as the 18th century, you know, so a good hundred years before, you know, Louis Pasteur like, looked in a microscope and saw these disease carrying organisms, um, you know, Chinese physicians, had a concept of, of germs. Um, so it wasn't that it was it, it was foreign to them. I also in the 19th century, as more and more medical missionaries come from Britain and the United States and elsewhere, elsewhere to the to China, um, Chinese practitioners of Chinese medicine were exposed to Western style medicine in any number of ways. And so, you know, what does that mean in terms of what they practice? Again, I mean, there's, there's not a real rigidity um, or rejection of what works. So, um, so yeah, I, I do see herbalists in the United States talking about germ theory and, and embracing it. They weren't um, opposed to Western style scientific medicine. They just, um, it was opposed to them, you know, it was, they, they were very um, kind of interested in and accepting of um, the theories that they felt were viable or, um, you know, credible. Uh, I have examples of practitioners of Chinese medicine who send their children to Western style doctors. You know, if, if they have a, a child who has a treatment that they can't treat, they, they go and they try to, you know, something outside of the traditional um, Chinese repertoire. Um, so this is a, a question about kind of the origins of some of these Chinese medicine practitioners who are immigrating to the, to the United States. Um, and, and this person is, is wondering, they write, since immigration historians have documented most of the Im immigrants were mostly Cantonese coming from Hong Kong, um, have you seen any particular influence from the Canton, Guangdong, or Hong Kong region in your research about Chinese medicine? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yes, so in the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, most Chinese immigration was coming from southern China. Um, do they, th then it becomes a question of do they kind of, um, do they reflect some regional characteristics of that, uh, you know, it, do they import those regional characteristics um, to their practice? And this is again a methodological challenge. It's actually really hard to open up the exam room and say, what is happening there? Um, I do have some prescription pads. So, so, so the, um, the formulae that Chinese doctors were writing up and then giving to patients and um, folks who study those say they don't really look like, um, they're not carbon copies of what you would find in Southern China. Again, I think because there was a lot of 
improvisation um, and a lot of substitution and also, frankly, a lot of poor training. So these physicians, if they had stayed home, would have been trained in a single proprietary remedy. They end up bringing textbooks with them to the United States because they know they're going to practice more generally. And they're kind of learning in a very haphazard way. They're, they sometimes exchange letters with one another. I'll see letters that say, you know, oh, I have this patient with this condition. What should I give him? Um, or they'll look it up in one of the, their kind of medical manuals that they've bought. But it's really hard to identify those kind of currents between Southern China and the United States. I'm sure they're there. Um, there were a lot of conversations happening in Southern China around the time that um, it, uh, mass immigration to the United States began. Um, I suspect that um, those Chinese physicians who came to the United States were influenced by the kinds of conversations that were happening in Southern China having to do with drug therapy and um, kind of ways to formulate medicine in a milder, kind of more harmonious way. I absolutely think that was happening and and I have very little evidence you know to really say concretely well this is what they brought with them and this is what they rejected um, so I, I have when I ask a question and this is kind of related to my own research about kind of the emergence uh, or the rediscovery as you call it of acupuncture in the 1970s um, so this is a little bit later than what you were focusing on in your talk but I'm curious if you could give a little bit of background information about why it was the case that in the 1970s, suddenly um, Americans became really, really excited about um, Chinese medicine and acupuncture in, in particular. What was going on at that time that, that caused people to, to really kind of rediscover Chinese medicine? Yeah, I think there was a kind of perfect storm of things that were happening in the 60s and 70s. Um, part of it had to do well, part of it had to do with what was happening in China, honestly, uh, in Maoist China, and the way that that Mao affected a, a revolution um, in acupuncture, that he uh, took what, what was a, a sort of um, a already evolving medical therapy, and he sort of simplified it, scientized it. So there's already in China the production of a new type of acupuncture that is ready for export. And then in the United States, um, you know, in the United States, it was supposed to be a golden age of medicine. Um, you can point to all sorts of medical advances that happened in the middle part of the 20th century, especially kind of coming out of World War II. Um, all sorts of advances in, in drug therapy, in, in vaccine technologies. Um, you know, it was supposed to be the case that Americans were living with better medical care than they'd ever had before. But it actually had this weird effect of fomenting a lot of discontent with, um, with American medicine, with kind of um, mainstream Western style medical science. Um, people were dissatisfied with specialization. Um, they were dissatisfied with what they felt was maybe the over prescribing of these drugs. They were um, really worried that surgeons were over prescribing surgery. So you see, especially among a kind of middling affluent class of Americans, a feeling like um, maybe Western style medical science was um, not in fact uh, as, as let's say productive of good health as it was billed to be. And you get at the same time, that same class of people increasingly excited about and interested in Eastern philosophies, um, Eastern religions. Uh, you have a generation of people who are looking across the Pacific, um, first, you know, at, at Japan and China, then at Southeast Asia, and really kind of looking for um, inspiration in a, in a sort of countercultural orientalist um, conception of what they might find there. So I think that when, um, when Nixon um, normalized relations with China and kind of opened up China to American journalists, um, opened up uh, sort of the American imagination to what was going on in China, uh, there was already a, a population there, a, an affluent population, so a population primed and able to experiment with a new medical therapy or a very ancient medical therapy that was new to them. Um, uh, so, so there's a sort of perfect storm of these two things, like reaching across the ocean toward each other.
That's great. Um, and you know, what's so wonderful about this period is that, I mean, your book kind of goes up to the 1970s as this, um, the, the reimagination of Chinese medicine in the United States. And, and May's book actually kind of starts in the 1970s and, and takes the story from there. So it provides kind of two nice bookends. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this question has to do with um, issues of, of race and racism that was experienced by um, the, these Chinese medicine doctors in the United States. Um, and so this question asks, um, I'd like to hear more about how the Chinese doctors navigated racist discourses. Um, for instance, that the Chinese and that Chinatowns lacked hygiene, that they trafficked in opium and so on. So how did these Chinese doctors negotiate such racist discourses? Yeah, they, so a ton of my book deals with just this question. And so, and I only have five minutes, so I won't go on at great length. I'm gonna very quickly just address the issue of opium. Chinese doctors were always being identified as being purveyors of opium, you know, operating opium dens, trafficking in it. They did very little of that. Um, as far as I can tell, um, they didn't even really use medicinal grade opium all that often in their practice. Um, so almost all of it was just created by a sensationalist press. And they didn't, um, they, I haven't found a lot of evidence of Chinese doctors being all that bothered by it. Um, so they don't spend a lot of time trying to dispel those notions. The other part, Chinatown as a kind of source of contagion, uh, Chinatown is having kind of like racialized hygiene problems. That was a challenge for Chinese doctors, especially when they were trying to recruit a non-Chinese clientele to come see them in Chinatown. So, I mean, part of what I see happening over time is actually a diaspora of Chinese herb shops that they move out of Chinatown. And they might do that for a number of reasons. I mean, certainly they do it um, because there's a lot of competition. They don't want to be across the street from, um, you know, another purveyor of herbs so that a customer kind of wandering around could just wander easily into their competitor shop. But I think they also do it because um, they, they want to kind of disassociate themselves with the space of Chinatown. And I'll just say Anna Dawn, who I mentioned, her family um, wound up in Tucson. They, 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 they had about 19 different shops all across the American West. Um, she, call, she calls, she likens it to McDonald's, that it was a sort of franchise where they just kept opening different franchises all around. But what she said was that her dad, when he arrived in a new town, would just he never even like set foot in Chinatown. He just found some white neighborhood where he could set up shop. He got a house for the family. The kids and the mom all sort of lived in the back and he would take their living room, the parlor, the front room and turn it into his herb shop that he was quite deliberate about avoiding um, Chinese neighborhoods. And he wasn't the only one there. I have some other um, examples, um, other oral histories that I've done where that's clearly a, a, an effective strategy after a certain point um, when Chinese doctors have enough kind of language proficiency and confidence in their ability to live outside of ethnic enclaves, many, many of them did choose to do that. Well, thank you so much. That was such a wonderful presentation. And I have to say, um, having read your book and reviewed it, I, I, I have to say that it is honestly a, a really wonderful and su such a well-researched book and just coherently organized and well-argued. It is really a model of historical scholarship. Um, so thank you again to my two wonderful presenters, Tamara Bennett Chelton and Mei Jan. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. Um, the Lunar New Year festivities are going to continue now in a other virtual location. We will drop the link for that in the chat. You will have to register, but your registration should go through immediately. So I hope to see some of you over there in that other virtual platform. But if not, uh, take care. Happy Lunar New Year. And I will hopefully see you at our next event. Have a good night. Happy New Year.